Welcome to this second video on value mapping inside of Reactor. We'll be looking at dynamic value mapping. And the main point of that is when you have a static fader like the one you find on a uh, RCP often, or in this case, a right fusion live, that fader won't move anywhere. We also have dynamic faders or motorized faders that can move with the change in value. But in many cases, on uh, such as an RCP, and ooh, I have an old one here, which is RCP Mini from years back. This joystick for lens control, adjusting the iris of a lens, does not move motorized or anything. It just gets into a position. And the thing is, if you decide to use an RCP in a slightly unusual way where it controls multiple cameras, then when this fader is in this position, you change camera. It may not let uh, any more correspond to the position of that lens. So this is why you need a strategy for handling that. And we call that discontinuity strategy. And that is uh, what I will give examples of in this case. This video is the second. As I said, we looked at static value mapping in the first one. And in this case, we have now changed up to the layer dynamic value mapping in this project, which you can download. So look in the links if you want to check these things out and play with them yourself. But inside of this one, we have a number of layers that just define different fader behaviors for the fader here so that we can explore these strategies. I think I'll start out by giving examples of what I mean. So by this way, we'll learn what it is we are dealing with. So I'll just limit my view a little bit here because I want to use my emulator over here on the side to move the fader. And I think this, this is probably fine. Yes. Okay. Um, what I've done is uh, create this button here so that if I click this button, you can see that I'm moving through different uh, ones of these layers. So as I do that, I have different definitions of the fader. And right now I am on something called uh, double linear one and two. And then we have one called straight. So let's try the straight one up here in this window, we see a variable called absolute. That variable is uh, found on each of these layers. So it's individual values and that mimics if you had a um, lens with an iris, like from f 1.4 to f 32, or some abstract number that indicates the lens position for iris. So um, we're just using a variable for the sake here of the demonstration and the teaching. So as I'm moving through this range, you see the value of the variable absolute also shown in this display is just moving linearly. If I'm in the middle, we are around 500. If I'm at the end, we're around 1000. Here we are at zero. So it is hopefully predictable for you. Now, the thing is, if I leave the fader here and then we assume that we change the layer to double linear here, as I'm now moving the fader, you can see this value will change from zero to some value. Now, actually, <clears throat> we are already thrown into the game now because the fader was like one quarter up, but the value was at zero. And instead of just forcing through a value when I started moving around 200, it started at zero. And that's the clever thing about double linear mapping. Let's just try to move the fader a little bit more. Let's move it up to this position around 700. And I'll explain what happens over here in a moment. If we then go to the second layer called double linear, this one double linear two. So let's just move up to that one. Again, notice the value is zero. The lens value is zero, but the fader is three quarters up towards the top. Again, if I take the fader and start moving it down, well, it's better to move it up. You'll see that it starts slowly to move the value with that like one quarter left of the fader range, it is starting to move it from zero to 1000 actually. That is double linear handling of the discontinuity that is present here because the fader does not correspond with the value of the lens. We can't move the fader in position. And as I move all the way up to the top, I will eventually reach 1000 right there. All right. As I do that, you'll now see that as I move down, we go through the full range again like this. Let's just leave it here. And then let's go back to the previous double linear mapping. Currently, this one is claiming something discontinuity offset here. But once again, regardless of that, notice that we are at the value 706. So as I now grab the fader and start moving it down, 
you see it is continuing from that value 700 even though that would justify the theta being up here if i move it up it is also going from there so it's like there's this double linear curve that maps the value and as i get close to the end that becomes more and more flat eventually becoming a flat line the discontinuity offset is a measure for the internal fact that we are compensating for the theta being out of position related to the value and you see the discontinuity offset, you know, the bigger it is, the bigger the difference was for where the theta was. But that value is going to be less and less and less as I'm moving toward the end. So regardless of which end I'm reaching, eventually it's going to be zero. And then we have programmed this button to not blink anymore. But this would just indicate that we do not have a fully perfect linear range of moving this theta just yet. Because we are in this state where we are um compensating for the discontinuity so that means that in this way having discontinuity um strategy for double linearity applied to the fader action for um, all the faders that would exist in a configuration for multiple cameras then we can handle this uh, the discontinuity that would uh, exist Let's um, move up to, well, we could take this one again. We'll just, yeah, actually, that's that's probably a nice example because now I changed to the other one. Like if I change camera and here we have a value of 340, that means like the, the fader should be around here. The discontinuity is currently set to be zero. So that means last time we left this fader, it, it had perfect linear motion. The moment that we now grab it and start moving it, it will notice that this... Um, the position of the fader was actually out of the place where it should be if we had a perfect continuity. And that means the moment I move it, you see, it's going to set a discontinuity offset of 300 and, or 403, which is basically the distance from where it was left and where it is now grabbed. And it's blinking yellow to indicate, ooh, we have discontinuity applied uh, discontinuity strategy applied until we reach the end okay we have something similar going on we have a different strategy called offset if i move up to that strategy let's tr try that once again we see that it says uh, absolute zero and uh if i grab it and start moving it let let's see what i mean this warrants that the fader should be at the very bottom but it's actually up here so let's just see what happens if we start moving the fader now in this case um to have this functioning we we actually need to have moved or exercised the fader at least once before it is um, working. So this is why it is not picking up any discontinuity offset right here. But let's just move back to this. And then we just move this a little bit. And then we go back to the offset layer here and we'll see what happens. Okay, so really the fader should be around here, but it is up here. So what's going to happen? Notice discontinuity offset is set, but the value is 300. And it's just going to stay 300. You see, as I move it up, I hit 650. And it has 350 to go, right? So regardless, it is not changing the discontinuity um, offset as I'm doing this. Actually, it's only when I get below the zero point. This is my zero point. You see, when I then move towards the zero, it's reducing the discontinuity offset. And now if I go all the way up to the top, it won't go any further than... 1000 minus 256 and only when i get to the very bottom here here all right then i'm totally out of discontinuity so once again the offset is just moving it linearly so no double um, linear strategy it's just you know translated basically and then the final strategy that we have is one called catch up. That's a new one that we have added. And basically what that means is that um, it will only start changing the value when the fader is back more or less at where it was before. So let's try that out. We are now at 272. Let's move over to the offset, move the fader around to like here. And then we go back to catch up. Now, the discontinuity straight offset is also going to show a value as I now grab the fader. It will notice that we are out of position with the fader. So I need to move all the way down to where the fader was before, before it's going to move the value in any direction, all right? It also works the other way around. So uh, of course it does. So if I change over to offset here and I move that a little bit like that, then if we now play catch up, you see that it, it, I need to move the fader up to around here before anything's gonna happen. It is now going to blink blue. It will show a negative value. And that value means that 
yes, you have a little bit to go because you are sort of too low compared to where it's supposed to be. And then there we hit the value and now it catches up with the value and we can move the failure in this range. All right, so that were the um, different, that was the different discontinuity strategies that exist. Uh, catch up that needs to reach the fader needs to get into the previous position before it changes the value. We have the double linear strategies that will basically uh, work with the value anywhere it is and try to make the best of it. And then we have offset that is a little bit like the catch up version, but where it's just translated everything, but you can't reach the ends necessarily until you have been in the other end. And finally, uh, with the straight uh, version, then uh, let's let's go to the straight. The uh, the default, of course, is that as you are changing these things around, um, yeah, okay, that's the straight version. Um, let's just move that value to here, and then I want to go somewhere else, move it around because we have not demonstrated the straight version. Okay, so uh, right now in the straight version, of course, the default is if we have a value of 805 and we are here with a fader, if I start moving that fader, yeah, it's just going to jump hard to that value. And that was the problem we were trying to solve. Now, with the straight version, I have implemented something else. But um, let's first check out how these strategies were applied to the fader behavior for the double linear offset and the catch up version. It's quite simple. So if we check out the configuration in the JSON for these, then it is called discontinuity strategy. And there's a keyword called double linear. There's even a little bit of a help text here. So use that if you want. And the double linear version here is um, the one that we have applied here, but also here. And if we go to the fader behavior up here for offset, it just says offset. And then if you go to catch up, it says catch up. The discontinuity strategy gauge is a IO reference you can set to a variable that can be used to display the discontinuity of each of these. So I've created these variables, discontinuity offset, set it to a, to a value range from minus 1000 to plus 1000, or you could also have uh, clicked accept any value. Um, but you need to either do the one or the other, otherwise the value would be normal or constrained within the uh, ranges for the variable. And that helps me to get that little gauge out in the display here, but also to relate it to how this button is lighting up in different colors, which is something I just did because I thought if you were to um, make a configuration for this, then you would love to do that so that uh, there would be a visual indication whether people need to move the fader up or down, or if you are in this discontinuity uh, mode, uh, then I, I did it in this way, having conditional feedback where the active if basically says that if the discontinuity offset is, is higher or lower than zero, then it will light up in yellow or blue color and blink the button as well. So that's that's what I've been setting up for you to the um, uh, behavior uh, alias here for all these uh, actions. The final aspect of dynamic value scaling is the trimming functions. And with the trimming functions, it's possible to create a lower and a higher limit for value um, in the range that a fader is moving in. And I'll just straight show you how this works. It's also in the same configuration. So on the straight layer here, then as we move the, uh, the fader, you see it's moving in the range from zero to 1000. But over on the side, I have uh, created tr uh, two trimming values, which are just variables that um, the, the one is called trim low and the other one is, is called trim high. So for instance, if I increase the uh, value of this one, let's just do that. You see it is forcing the lower value of the fader up from the bottom, from zero up to 40, okay? So it can now only operate in this range. And likewise, if I uh, do it on this one, uh, notice that I'm just clicking once to have a course um, change of the value. So now it, it jumps in steps of 10 instead of steps of one. Uh, so I could bring it to 900 uh, here, and then that would be now the top of the value range. You see, it doesn't go any further than this. It, it goes down to 40 there. So let's move it up to 100 and 900. And then this is the range the fader will move within, but also notice, that the value of the fader is changing as I'm changing these values. That's the dynamic aspect of it. 
The dynamic aspect is that as I'm changing this, it will recalculate and resend the um, the, the way the, the fader would affect, the, in this case, the value of the uh, variable absolute. And um, that, that's special. That's the um, complex aspect of this because it would be easy to um, just set a value and then the next time you move the fader, it is operating within that range. But a little bit like having the double linear, the offset and also the catch up dynamic value mapping functions in the same way these trim high and low would then be something you could apply to once again imagine iris let's say that you move all the tie you know all the way to to the max iris of a lens and then you would simply use the trim high to trim down the value until it it gets to the highest value you want to be possible or want to be able to reach with the fader. The same way you could go all the way to the bottom and then you could you know raise the floor basically. Okay, so uh, just to give you an idea about how this really works, I um, want to go back to my spreadsheet again. Oh, in fact, I just have a, a slideshow here. But now we have range from 200 to 800. So what would that correspond to if we're thinking about mapping? So let's just go over to this slideshow. Well, basically, we have a range from zero to 1000. And when we are at zero, it would come out as 200. And when we are at 1000, then it would come out as the value 800. So this is the mapping that would happen right now in this case. So let's say that we uh, we increase this value up to 900. What would that mean? That would mean that as we reach 1000 on the input side, 900 is what is coming out in the other end. Well, usually you would use it like that, but you could actually also do something else. You could go beyond. So what happens if we go to uh, 1100? It's possible. If you go to 1100, it means that you won't get any further than 1000 because this is the output of any absolute component in raw panel that is values from zero to 1000. But it means this, like if I put the line up here, it actually means that as we are having input values, um, from about 900 up to 1000, they'll be capped by 1000. So it actually means that a little bit of the range here on the top, you see this range doesn't affect the value over here until we reach about this point. All right. So that corresponds to what I just said. And in the same way, by the way, if I press and hold, then I would reset this value, I could go uh, lower. So let's just go to something like this. Yes. All right. So what this would correspond to is basically this scenario. In other words, there'll be like a dead zone at the lower end of the uh, fader. So let's just check this out. Uh, I go to the lower range here and then I move it up. You see there's a dead zone now and then it starts moving. So it is going between zero and 1000, but we have a little bit of dead zone in both ends. So that's the consequence of using a value below and beyond the um, uh, the, the main range, which is zero. Now I press and hold to reset and press and hold to reset this one, 1000. So this is the dynamic value scaling methods that exist inside Reactor and um, an advanced view into these. Um, did I already show you the JSON code behind this? I think I did for all the, uh, the, the various uh, discontinuity strategy uh, cases, but with the fader, it looks like this. Um, so once again, it's something that's available in the JSON, um, uh, in, in the JSON handling of your event handlers. It will come into the UI at some point, I'm pretty sure. But right now you uh, put in this object called value mapping and inside of that you have trim on or off. So there's something, I mean, you, you can turn this on and off and it's inherited and so on. And then you have trim low and trim high, which are references to, um, some sort of IO reference, in this case, a variable is likely to be what you want to control this. That variable can be either local for the for the particular layer, or it could be global for a whole configuration. So that's just standard um, reactor uh, features that can be used to define the trim low and trim high uh, value ranges.